Thank you for coming to the advanced Appium training session. Uh, and let's go ahead and get started. So first things first, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dan Cuellar. I'm the creator of Appium. I'm head of software testing at Fruitit in London. Um, previously, I've worked for Shazam and Zeus in Microsoft. And way back in the day, I went to school and got a computer science degree. Um, but anyways, first off, I think things first. Uh, you may be wondering why I'm not in Bangalore. Well, let me teach you something about the American passport here. So, you may see that this passport appears to have enough space for a one-page India visa stamp, but you would be incorrect. Uh, as you noted, this page is marked visas, and uh, this page is marked endorsements, and apparently they care about that at the border in India. So, I got to come back to rainy London, uh, and I'm here broadcasting live from the Fooded headquarters in the bowels of Four Crown Place, bunkering down for whatever happens with the Brexit vote today. Uh, but hopefully you enjoy this talk, and I will join you later, and I will take your questions and answer them live via some sort of Skype or VoIP or something. Um, anyway, so today, here's what we're going to talk about. So I'll start with a brief overview of the story of Appium. We'll move on to what's new in 1.5. We'll talk about automating Mac and Windows applications. Then I'll show you some advanced techniques that I've seen and done by others over the last few years. Uh, and at the end, we'll have some time for questions, and I'll close with a something or other. So anyways, Appium. For those of you who don't know what it is, I'm about to tell you the story of Appium. Um, but this is an advanced session, so hopefully you know what it is and you came here. But I know that's not true, probably. Um, so let's talk about how Appium came about. So it all starts with what I call the most terrifying five words in software testing. So normally I would ask you to guess what those are, and then you'd guess something, and then I'd laugh at your guess because it's probably funny. But since this is a video, I'll just tell you what they are. They are available on the App Store. So you might be wondering, why is that terrifying? Well, that's terrifying because on the App Store, you're not allowed to just push out new code whenever you like. There's a lengthy review process. So when you make mistakes, they're quite expensive. So I took over a new, site, a new job at a dating site in San Francisco, which had a mobile app, which made quite a lot of money. And our mobile app kept having bugs in it. And whenever we'd have a bug, it would take us two to three weeks to roll out a patch because the App Store review process takes that long. And because of that, it became quite important to get things right, and testing became very important. So out of that, it spawned a need for some sort of tool to automate our testing. And this is 2011. So at the time, Appium did not exist, and many of the solutions we use nowadays, if you're not an Appium user, weren't around either. And so I needed something, and it reminded me of my days earlier in my career when I worked on other things where testing was more important. Um, having worked on websites for the previous few years, Websites are a lot different than other applications because you control the server and you can deploy new code. So if you make a mistake, you can send the new code onto the server and then the bug is fixed. Uh, whereas on desktop software, like something like this, um, and once you print it to the CD, you're sort of stuck with it. And the App Store is very similar to this. So whenever you write something to a CD, in order to change it, you've got to make a new one, which is quite expensive. Whenever you make a mistake on the App Store, there's a whole review process that happens that takes several days, and meanwhile, every day your company's losing money while that bug is out there. So I thought back to what we did, and there were several things we did for testing there that we don't, we, I never did on websites. And that amounted to code freezes and all sorts of sort of managerial practices to reduce bugs. That's not going to fly at a small dating startup. But one thing we did was heavy, thorough, automated testing. So I looked around what was out there at the time to do this on mobile, and everything was terrible. Um, it was all quite terrible. Um, I won't go through these tools individually. You guys are at this conference where I know what most of them do. Um, but they're all bad uh, in their own special way. Um, UI automation JavaScript was bad because it runs in JavaScript, and developers don't write apps in JavaScript for iOS. Uh, Robotium has me built as part of your application. You modify your application. It's written in Java. It's kind of limited, not of syntax people are familiar with. And then PhoneMonkey doesn't even deserve any more words about it. Um, so anyways, I came up with a solution, and I was at Selenium Conference, this conference you're at, only four years ago in London, and so I came to London, and I was there to talk about something else, and as part of my other talk, I showed um, my, what I was doing for iOS automation. We wrote a little driver-like thing that would control an iOS app with Selenium-like commands, and the talk was about the page object model and how if you abstracted your test correctly, you could use the same test on your website that you use on your mobile apps. And so on the web apps, it would use Selenium, and on the mobile apps, it would use our tool, which didn't really have a name at the time. And everyone thought that was really neat. 
not so much the page object model, because if you're at the Slam conference, I'm sure there's 10 talks today about the page object model. Uh, it's not something people aren't familiar with, but more that people were, I was automating uh, iOS with Selenium protocol or Selenium like protocol. And so at the end of the talk, I think the conference, I gave a lightning talk and people saw it and there was a big round of applause and then no one ever talked to me again and nothing happened. And then a few months later, I got a call from some people at Sauce Labs and they invited me to this conference. And then at this conference, a bunch of people were showing um, automation tools for mobile. And so unbeknownst to me, the people at Sauce Labs had started a fork of my project and started contributing to it and had put it in the cloud and things like that. And so at this conference, the open source project really started. It got the name Appium two days before. It's a funny story I probably don't have time for today, but someone can probably look up any other video I've done that probably told the story. Um, so anyways, after the mobile test summit, it really started to kick off. Uh, and so this is what Appium is, for those of you who aren't familiar, and don't worry, we'll get to the advanced stuff soon. I know this is a mad session. Um, these are the four pillars of Appium. I don't know who came up with them. I think it's Jason Huggins. I think it all stems back to a rubric for grading automation frameworks that he came up with for a conference. Uh, and Appium just happened to meet them, which is why he liked it, and the people at Soft Slabs jumped on board. Um, but Appium uses standard tech APIs and techniques. We don't use any private APIs. We don't do any hacking, no attacks, nothing like that. It's all legit. We use the tools the vendors provide. Uh, we allow you to code in the language of your choice. We do that by implementing the Selenium JSON wire protocol, which has bindings in a dozen or so different languages. Uh, we don't modify the application for testing. And as always, it's always free and open source. We don't charge for anything. So that's what it is. It's the currently most popular cross-platform mobile automation framework out there. There are big companies like Amazon and Microsoft who've jumped on board. We support Windows apps, we support Android apps, we support iOS apps. Uh, we're just generally there for all your apps. Um, whereas Selenium is for websites, we're for apps. Um, and it works just like Selenium. So you'll see, you write a test script, it sends HTTP commands over the JSON wire protocol to the server, it goes off and executes them in whatever the framework you need to for whatever platform you're using, and then it spits back to you a protocol from client response and voila, test automation, same as Selenium. By the numbers, we have 3,500 stars on GitHub. I think last time I checked, that was more than Selenium. I'll just rub that in while I'm there, but I could be wrong, I should check that. 2,000 forks, uh, over 150 people have submitted a patch, and our V1 had over 150,000 downloads. 1.5 has had many more than that, I think, so it's quite popular and it's used by a lot of people. And we have closed 3,500 issues, which is sort of a two-edged sword. One. We fixed a lot, but two, there were a lot of issues, which isn't great. So now on to the advanced new stuff that you all came here for. So I'm going to talk about what's new in Appium 1.5. And I normally have this slide be blank because there's really nothing new in it. Uh, but if you coerce me to say what's new in it, um, there's a complete rewrite of our entire code base. We now have continuous integration and unit tests all around. Uh, our command line arguments have largely been moved to capabilities and we're getting to be a more legitimate project. There's a code of conduct and a governance structure and those sorts of exciting things that some people care about. Um, so why did we do this? Um, three years of patches and organic growth led to a total mess. The first version of Appium was never even designed to support Android, and then one day someone came up with a patch to do that, and we sort of patched it in there. And so you can just understand from the beginning that Appium was never really intended to become what it has become. And because of that, it needs a bit of rewrite. Um, we were getting lots of complaints from our customers about how unstable it was. Uh, generally, when we patch one thing, we break other things. Uh, our code wasn't very modular. We had many layers of callbacks. If anyone's ever contributed to patch, I'm sure they've seen that. And the whole thing was generally poorly tested or really never tested except by the end users. Um, so anyways, now it's beautiful when there's this organized structure that someone can show you that's not me. But just know that it's better. Um, so anyways, because we've done this big rewrite now, it's going to enable us to do a lot of things really soon in the future. Um, some of these are actually already done on this list. Uh, Windows Phone and Windows 10, 10 applications for it. Microsoft is currently working on that. It's in beta right now. I will provide the link to it later if you want to get on board with that. Uh, the new GUIs, I don't think of them started my knowledge yet. We have two new iOS backends that are nearing done, if not usable at this point. Uh, an Android backend rewrite is wrapping up hopefully soon. Uh, better docs and onboarding material, we were working on that as well, and then there's a foundation and some rules and things now, and as we looked at the pull requests being submitted lately, you'll notice they're a lot more organized and there's a lot more structure in them, which is helping. 
So the first thing we're going to talk about that's more advanced is desktop apps. So Appium's mission is to automate apps. Desktop apps are apps. I think from the beginning we always thought this day might come, and thanks to Microsoft and some other people, um, it has come. So if you want to learn about the Windows support, here's a link to it. There's a project called WinAppDriver. It works with Visual Studio 2015. You can use it without Visual Studio 2015 if you want to as well. It's really easy to install. You download an installer. It's really simple. Uh, and Microsoft is working on making it work well with Windows 10. And from what I've seen, you, you may even be able to go a little bit further back than that. And if not, with this tool, with another one I'll talk about in just a second. So this is really cool. I was really excited to get an email from Microsoft, I want to say it was nine months ago, saying they were interested in doing this. And it's really cool now that it's actually usable and I can play with it. Um, I'm not going to show a video of it today, but I'll show you a video of another framework. Um, just because I haven't recorded one yet of using the Microsoft stuff. I don't have a Windows machine. <laughs> Anyways, um, but also, before Microsoft did it, there were some fellows over in Siberia and Russia who came up with a framework that did the same thing, and it works with Windows 8 and Windows 8.1 and maybe even Windows 7 and Windows phone devices. So if you want to check that out, here's the link to that. They're really cool guys. It's a really useful framework, but Microsoft has taken this on, which is great too. You'll notice this is a very similar thing that's happened with the web project on Selenium, whereas we used to, where Selenium used to write drivers for different browsers, now people like Microsoft and Google and Safari even have the Apple people take it on lately, which is really nice to see. Um, so I'll just show you a quick video of what a Windows test looks like. I'll skip ahead. So you can see it's just Selenium code, nothing terribly different than what you've seen before, but what you'll notice is that it's going to be automating an app now on Windows Phone. And so you'll see there's the little Windows Phone emulator up. And it's just running a test, just like any other device using Appium. Um, and this is a demo of the Winium project, which is from the Russian people I mentioned earlier. Um, so cool, this is a test that's just going to go through, and I believe it's an address book or a calendar or something like that. <laughs> there you go. Filling out this form. Just, you know, you guys have seen all this before. It's just test automation. Uh, and now the same thing they've done on a desktop app, so I'll show you how that works as well. There's my mouse. Uh, and once again, we'll skip ahead a bit. Regular Selenium looking code. And now, you'll see, I'm going to wait for the calculator app to launch on Windows, and we're going to run a sample calculation. Um, and there you go, there's your calculator. Running some test automation, all using Appium Framework. Uh, there's a bunch of other people jumping on board with this. I didn't have time to put in this presentation, but there's some chatter on the Appium discussion group that if you read it religiously, as I don't, you'll notice that there's some other cool things like UITV and other people that are bringing stuff on board. Um, so maybe other kinds of apps in the future, such as television apps, maybe even Apple TV. <laughs> I haven't looked into it, but I imagine it's possible. Uh, another project I always bring up, so I'll just start off by saying that this project it's sort of abandonware for me. I made it many years ago. It still works. There are a few people that use it. Uh, I would love it if a community formed around it, but not that many people are making money with Mac applications these days. So it doesn't have a whole lot of usage, but it does work. Uh, and it's called Appium for Mac. It runs separate from Appium, but you can automate a Mac OS X, or Mac OS as they call it now, application. Uh, I haven't tested it with Mac OS Sierra, but it shouldn't be that hard to work. Um, the way it works is it uses the accessibility layer on OS X to find elements and interact with them the same way an assistive device would for a person with some kind of disability, like vision impairment or not able to hold a mouse, something like that. So those APIs in theory still exist on Mac OS Sierra, and in theory you should still be able to use them to automate it. So not too worried about it working going forward. But uh, here is the calculator test you just saw on Windows, only we're going to run it on Mac. That was pretty quick. I'll play it again. There it goes. Uh, so, I'm going to launch the calculator app, run a calculation, make sure it's correct. Same test uh, using Appium for Mac. Cool. Let's move forward. Um, so, now onto some more advanced material. Uh, one thing people always tell me is I can't get multiple devices working on Appium. Well, I'm here to prove you wrong, and hopefully the sound comes out. Uh, I may have to get the volume on the TV, but um, you can do that. 
And I'll show you right here, Jonathan of Sauce Labs, who I don't think is at the conference, but this is an old video of him from several years ago, having a backup band playing of Appium devices. So, here's the sound. Uh, you can see he's plugging his guitar in here. Yeah, you can turn off the, the uh, headlight. And he's going to play, and he has an Appium script that's going to send the score of his music to four Android emulators and an iOS simulator. Two of them will be playing drums, two of them keyboards, and one of them will be giving him the vocals. Check. So you'll see here, four Appium instances at once, four Android, one iOS, and then Jonathan, of course, playing the guitar. I won't make you watch the whole video, it's on YouTube if you want to see it. Um, but, not to be outdone, Jonah from Sauce Labs wrote a MIDI sequencer, or a MIDI sequencer, I guess, that will take a MIDI file and it will send one of each of the 16 channels to a different phone. He calls it Appium Jukebox. I think it's Jonah. And so here's a demo of the Appium Jukebox playing Eye of the Tiger using 16 devices. I think they're all Android. Um, but let's go ahead and skip ahead to the uh, later in the video. You can see, you hear the music, hopefully there. And you can see this giant server with all these USB ports. And pretty soon you'll see a lot of Android phones. Each one is playing a channel from the MIDI file. Um, so once again, multiple servers does work, it's quite simple to do. Um, I don't have a code sample for you, but you can Google for one. You just make a different driver object for each device you want, call them 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever you like, and then you send commands to each one of them. The only trick with Appium is you need to launch one Appium server instance for each device, so that will require using a different port number for each and connecting to a different port number. But other than that, it's just like a regular test. Um, another cool topic I like to talk about, and this is one of those open source conferences, so I won't bring up the companies that do this sort of thing, but there are a few companies that do this sort of thing, and it's quite useful. Uh, there are tools out there that let you visually validate web pages and apps, and they're quite configurable. So the nice thing is you can check for layout changes and things that aren't directly A yields B sort of testable, but are more subtle. So there are nice little tools where there are websites where you can go mark up the web page and say these areas can change, these areas can't change. So you can mark like the clock and things like that that you expect to be different every time you run the test. But you can mark other things to detect changes and then it'll send back to you a result where you can see on an image the areas denoted that have unusual or unexpected content. And then you can either approve it so that your future tests expect that new content or you can deny it and you can log a bug and you can investigate it on your own. So it's really neat. You just use baselines, you baseline it, and then when things change, you get a notification, and you look through it, and if the notification is undesired, then you can go fix the app, and you can mark the test if it's desired, and then it won't ever bug you about it again. Um, so there's some people at the conference. I won't name names, but they're out there, so go look for them. They work at companies uh, that do this sort of thing. Uh, and there's also some cloud providers that support uh, Find My Image uh, in Appium, which is really neat for things like games, where you don't have the whole level of DOM that you normally have. So here's a blog post by a guy named Simon, uh, who has done this, and I think he uses Sekuli in this. So if you check this out, this will let you use Find by Image in your Appium tests. Uh, but if not this, there's other providers, uh, cloud providers that haven't implemented server side. They haven't shared their code. I wish they would, but they haven't. But you can do it. Uh, so look at, at for an Appium cloud provider that provides Find by Image support. They're also probably there at the conference. Um, Another thing I want to show you guys, which I'm sure at this conference you've seen before, is that Appium supports what I'll deem mechanical testing. Um, there's a blog article, I forgot to put a link into it, but just tweet me or something and I'll send it to you. Um, it shows how this works, but um, I'll show you this. This is something Jason Huggins and I did at Selenium Conference in Boston a few years ago. And it's just an Appium test that sends a tweet um, oh, that's loud. Um, so that's going to try to just say, uh, O-H-A-I. And that just sent. Great <laughs> thing. Yeah, so what's neat about this is your existing Appium tests already work with this robot. Once again, uh, this thing is free, so I can actually tell you what it's called, and that wouldn't be unethical. It's called uh, Tapster, and it's 3D printable, and it's tapsterbot.org or something like that. It's made by Jason Huggins, who's the creator of the original Selenium. Um, he has a company, I think, that has some other stuff to sell you, probably, but 
I know there's an open hardware version of this outlet that you can check out, and it's been at several of the Selenium conferences, so it's probably old news to you guys. Yeah. But how the Appium integration works on top of it is actually quite neat. Um, the trick is you just need to map points in the physical world to points on the actual device, and we do that by launching a calibration app with Appium on the machine, and we lower the robot until it makes contact with the app. The app will get a new GUI element whenever it's touched that has the coordinates of what's being touched. Uh, so once the robot sort of strikes gold, we know where the screen is in the z-axis, and we can pull the finger back. And then we just take two more points, and with those points, we can build a translation matrix that will tell you where anything is on the app. So when you enable the robot mode, which I'm sure many of you have noticed in the app, your Mac app, um, all your touch actions will go to the robot instead of to the device, which is really neat. And it just asks Appium to find the screen coordinates of it, finds the center, and then tells the robot to push that. So quite simple. No extra work. Just some math, but the map's math's done by Appium, so it's not so bad for you. At one point, I probably understood what all this meant, but that was a long time ago, and I'm not going to try to explain it to you, but I have a Medium blog article on this, if you want to know more about this. Um, I don't think it's actually working in 1.5, but if you go down to 1.4 on Appium, you can use this kind of stuff. At some point, I'll probably get it working again, but it's not really like a high priority. Um, so, grab bag of other cool things. Um, we have two new iOS backends, and this is really important to talk about. Um, so one is WebDriver Agent, which is a separate automation framework written by the people at Facebook. Uh, you can see the GitHub link to that. Um, some cool things that it supports that haven't ever been supported in Appium before are that it supports multiple simulators at once, which is really cool. And you can automate apps for which you don't have the source code, so that's quite neat as well. Hopefully this is all still true, my knowledge I've got data on this. And I'm sure, I know, ask Simon, Simon Stewart, for more information on this. Uh, but I'll just mention that Appium supports sending commands to WebDriver Agent now. Uh, and you just give automation named WebDriver Agent. And I think you need Appium 1.5.3 or higher. So that's relatively new. Um, and I think you do have to build it in separately. I don't think it ships with Appium. But there will be instructions if you look around the Appium website for this. Uh, XCUI test is another framework we support. It's the new one from Apple. Apple at WWDC two years ago announced they were using a new UI automation framework that uh, has a Swift and an Objective-C front end to it. Um, it is integrated into the Xcode app for a change. Um, so they're going to replace UI automation JavaScript with this framework. So at Appium, we've gotten ahead of the curve and we've already implemented this. Um, last time I checked, it wasn't entirely working from the Apple end, but from the Appium end, it was pretty good. Uh, and I know that this made some progress in the meantime. So in the future, don't worry, even though we're using a deprecated framework in UI Automation JavaScript, your Appium test will continue to work on iOS going forward. We'll do the translation for you whenever iOS 10 comes out and UI Automation JavaScript is no longer an option. Um, then just stay posted on that. That'll probably happen in the next four or five months. Um, now I'm gonna move on to something cool that someone showed me. I was in Portugal a few weeks ago and there's this group of people I work with down there that always have the most interesting problems with Appium. It's a sort of like a consultancy that builds mobile apps for different providers like Vodafone and whatnot. And they had the problem where they were getting SMS validation codes and they couldn't read them with Appium. And they always come up with the most interesting solutions. So I'm gonna show you what they did. And I find this is really useful for many things. Um, so here we go. All you need to do is go to your settings on your iPhone before you run the test and set up something called uh, in the notification center, set your messages app to send notifications as alerts. Uh, and the nice thing about alerts is alerts show up in your app without changing the app, and you can read them with Appium, and you have to dismiss them. So whenever you have something like a validation code to register or something like that, if you have the setting enabled on your phone, you'll get an alert during your app with the validation code. So it's pretty neat, pretty simple, not too hacky. Um, there's probably a way to set this programmatically but I'm the wrong person to ask about that. Um, so anyways, this is a really cool trick they showed me. Beforehand, they were doing other things like pulling down the notification tray, tray and trying to read it and things like that. Um, I think they have an app open source. I couldn't get the GitHub link for it in time, but they have an app you can install on your Android phone to provide this exact same behavior on Android. So same exact thing when you get your SMS validation code, you can read it as an alert. Um, another thing I constantly hear complaints about is that the iOS simulator is slow. So, in previous versions of Appium, we bundled a product called Instruments Without Delay, which is invented or coded, whatever, by the people at Facebook. 
and it would method swizzle out a, a slow method in UI animation JavaScript that Appium uses a whole lot. Um, and unfortunately, with the way Xcode 7 and iOS 9 work, we're not able to do that automatically anymore. But there are directions on how you can do it manually, and it's really simple. You just check out a GitHub repository, and you run a shell script, and then pretty much everything's as it was before. Unfortunately, we can no longer do it automatically. Ask someone else there for the exact reasons. I don't have time to explain in this video. But you can still get them fast again. Don't worry. Um, I just wanted to put that to rest. And so hopefully this will help a lot of people run tests a lot faster. So another thing I wanted to talk about was capabilities, some interesting ones that are newer and people may not have heard of. So there's one called Auto Web View, which is really useful for hybrid apps, Cordova apps, and things like that. So it just means you'll start the automation already inside the web view. So if you're using Selenium automation and using Appium to run it, so you're just automating a web page hosted in an app container, use this, print, uh, use this capability and your test will just work and you won't have to write any hacky, well, if it's a phone gap app, then switch to the web view and switch out that kind of thing. This will just start you right there. On Android, there's one called Ignore Unimportant Views, which will collapse your hierarchy. If you've ever looked at the Android UI hierarchy in depth, it can be quite deep. You could have 40 or 50 levels. Most of that is just organizational views that group things together. Um, so this will just collapse all those away and it'll make your app automation run a little bit faster from my experience and you won't lose any functionality. Um, there's also one called Native Web Screenshot. It will toggle taking screenshots with the native layer, so with Appium instead of with Chrome driver or whatever you're using. So if you notice you're getting funny looking screenshots, I always hear this, oh, these screenshots look weird. They don't look like what's actually on the device. You can use this and it will use the other screenshot mechanism in its place. Um, so I hear that complaint a lot and people don't know how to fix it. And so there's your answer. Um, iOS has a few more interesting ones as well. So location service is authorized. This is mainly used to prevent the, your app would like to use your current location pop-up that you always see at the beginning of your tests. And there's a bug, I think, in instruments where if that happens too soon, it can crash your tests. So if you pre-authorize it using this flag, that'll prevent those two problems from happening. And your app will have location services authorized and you can use them. There's also the auto accept and dismiss alerts capability. It's useful to prevent alerts from happening. So you can either accept them or you can cancel them all, whatever you want. Uh, native web tap will use a web tap from the Appium layer instead of the Selenium layer. So it won't be a JavaScript click event. It will be a, an Appium tap event. So that can be useful for certain kinds of UI components on the web um, that don't like it when you send a direct click using JavaScript. Uh, ignore fraud warning in Safari is good if you have like invalid HTTPS certificates and things like that. Or cross domain, I think cross domain stuff may be covered by this, but if not, there's a doc on cross domain fixes in the Appium docs. Um, also, enter key delay, you may notice that sometimes the keyboard isn't accurate because it's typing too quickly. So you can add a delay between keystrokes. It'll also make it more realistic. So I don't think most people type as fast as Appium can. Appium can generally type probably several hundred words per minute, which even the best secretary I've ever seen couldn't come close to. Um, so there's this enter key delay and it's milliseconds. So you can just put 50 milliseconds per key and I don't know how many words per minute that gives you, but you can do the calculation yourself. Um, there's also the same key strategy. So there's one by one grouped or set value. So this is sort of self-explanatory, but you can have Appium chicken peck as it does now and type all your keys or you can have it just set the value on the element and your tests will run a lot quicker if you don't really care about testing the keyboard interaction. But if you do have keyboard events that you want to test, or if you want to test for things like how to spell check interactions or things like that, you will definitely want to keep it in the default mode, which is one by one. Another cool thing on Android that I hope will come to iOS soon is the network conditioning. So in the Appium client drivers, you can set the network conditioning. And so here's a table of all the different values. So this is useful for toggling airplane mode on and off, Wi-Fi to sell, those kind of things. So this table will tell you what value to set, and then you can set it in your tests. Maybe someday someone will write an enumeration for this in Appium and make it a lot easier, but for now, this is sort of the table. Um, so zero, one, two, four, and six are your good values. I think three and five exist, but they do weird things that don't really exist on the phone. Um, so anyways, uh, those are some of the advanced topics I wanted to cover today. I wanted to leave a lot of time for questions. I wish I was there to answer them. You don't know how much I wish I was in India right now. It's flooding here in London. It's crazy. It's biblical weather. Um, but anyways, I'll they'll Skype me in or something at this point, and we'll chat. And then, yeah, I'll answer your questions. I think everyone can hear you. So first of all, thanks a lot for trying to uh, be up at 6 a.m. to be part of this conference. I know getting pushed out or deported from Dubai is not a pleasant Thing. But again, greatly appreciate you trying to be part of this conference. 
Uh, I think there are folks here who might have questions, so we'll quickly do a few rounds of questions and then uh, wrap up the talk. So guys, if you have any questions, uh, this is a good time to ask Dan. Yeah, go ahead. I'll probably need him to repeat you, but I can kind of hear you. Hi, Dan. This is Vimal. Um, I have a few questions. So, uh, one on the yeah, one on the network conditioning. Uh, so, you talked about network conditioning for Android. So, do we have any plans for iOS also? The closing talk. So, I'm going to just play that now. Uh, there's there's a few more minutes left in his closing. So, just kind of play that, and then we'll close this out. All right. Well, anyways, hopefully I was able to answer your questions if you asked any. And so I just wanted to close with a takeaway. Um, and this is what I've learned from this project. Um, and I like to always give the Steve Jobs quote at the end of my talks. Um, so anyway, Steve Jobs once said, life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact. Everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can build your own things that other people can use. And once you learn that, be the same again. And so I think this very accurately reflects my experience with Appium. These days, most of the work on Appium is done by people at several companies like Sauce Labs and other places. Uh, and largely, I do other things nowadays. But anyways, um, I just want to share with all you sitting in this room today, where I'm not, <laughs> that you too might have good ideas and you should share them with people. This all started four or five years ago, whatever it was, at the Selenium Conference in London when I got up and gave a lightning talk. And back then, no one knew who I was. There's nothing special about me. I'm no smarter than any of you. So I would encourage you all, if you have good ideas, create open source projects and share them with people. Go to conferences, give talks. They're always looking for more people to do it. And just get your ideas out there because while, you know, not every idea is brilliant, chances are one of you out there has something really cool that you've solved that none of, us, none of the rest of us have. And we would like that. So it'd be very nice if you could build some cool stuff and I could use it. And I encourage you to just go out there and share your ideas with people because the people that have the stuff out there right now are no better than you. They're no smarter than you. Uh, just because I made Appium doesn't mean I know anything about what should be done with test automation. And I would encourage you for the rest of the conference to view every other talk with a thorough dose of skepticism because you are capable of doing just as cool stuff as these people. So have no reverence for what came before you and come up with your own cool stuff and share it with people. I think that's really important. And I'd like to encourage all of you to do that because while most of my ideas are crap, I had a good one once and this is it. And now a bunch of people have made it even awesomer because I shared it with them. And I'd like all of you to do the same thing. And with that, I would like to say thank you, India, in the words of Alanis Morissette. And hopefully I can come back, or actually come, I guess I didn't go there, next year. Uh, thank you very much.